Okay, hi, very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, we'll be together 45 minutes in this uh, expert panel session with panelists I'll be introducing in a minute. I'll, I'm delighted to be with you uh, for this discussion. It's a discussion with you, it's a conversation in which we engage. Uh, we want to walk the talk today. We want to share examples in the real life where real companies, real organizations have made a good business sense out of being more sustainable. We want to show practical cases where technology adoptions, behavior changes had made business more profitable, while at the same time making a good impact on the environment, on the planet, on people around. So that was clearly spelled out by our CEO this morning. You've heard him loud and clear, no? So the vision is there clearly now, it's us to execute and make it happen. So the way we're gonna share those 45 minutes will be, uh, panelists will be invited to share what they do in their companies, what they see, but you will have time to interact with them, ask questions, uh, share your views, questions, how do you make it happen? You know, share examples in your organizations. So that should be interactive. What I want to do first is introduce my you know, great panelists uh, you have on stage. So from the left to the right, uh, I will invite you know, Martin uh, first to speak about you know, Cisco, what they are doing in transforming their own value propositions to their customers to make a good business out of, out of decarbonizing their customers' interactions. Uh, Martin deals with uh, alliances and strategic alliances within uh, uh, his company. He deals with us as one of his key business partners, Schneider Electric, and he's a very great specialist of IT and I, our IT infrastructure uh, can help uh, create a better world. We have Kevin, uh, we have Kevin on, his, uh, on his left. Kevin, Kevin has a specific role today. He's a host. He's from Marina Bay Sands, where this fantastic event is organized. So he's both a host, he's an executive committee member. Listen, he's a chief sustainability officer leading projects, development for the company, is at the executive committee of that company, which shows the importance this company places on creating an hospitality which is, which is green, events like this which are sustainable, and he will tell us much more about it. Uh, Mathis Wackernagel on his left. Mathis is, uh, you know, is a person I've been following over the last 25 years. I've been a fan, I'm still a fan of his works. He's uh, the founder and CEO today of Global Footprint Network. It's a Bay Area, California-based NGO think tank. He's invented, this person, the, all the calculation about ecological footprinting, environmental accounting. He's the one coming up every year saying to each country government how much they are compatible with one planet uh, ambition. He is speaking to many corporations and we'll hear from him what he, he sees as a potential avenue for sustainable businesses. And on this dev, we have Xu On from DP Architect. He's an engineer, he's completely passionate about the environment, but he brings it mainstream to his business of designing green buildings. So I'm sure you'll be excited by their testimony. About myself, so I'm in charge within Schneider Electric to work with the people around this marketplace to help them come up with a green set of value propositions in eco-structure. So you'll see in the booth uh, today, and you have at 2.15 today a tour for you to witness how sustainability is embedded into eco-structure power building plant in different ways to meet our customers' expectations. That's my job in the company. Quite pleasant jobs to have, actually. Uh, I want to say a few words to set the scene. What are we talking about today? Uh, what you know, many of, of you in your organization have may, you may have encountered, people say, oh, sustainability, this is good for wealthy companies, you know, when we have time, you know, for long term, good, good nice thing to do. But you know, today we're not gonna talk about the corporate citizenship agenda of companies, which is great. Uh, your companies have, our companies have. Today what we want to discuss is how customers expect value propositions which help them succeed to decarbonize themselves, to become more circular, more profitable while being less resource intensive. So today we talk about that combination of those two ambitions, being longer term, sustainable, uh, resource, uh, efficient, future-proofed, but at the same time delivering each quarter results, you know, which is the, the business in which we are. And more than long words, uh, I just want to share with you uh, an experience I had uh, just two years ago. I was in the Philippines visiting our factories and, and customers, and we visited one of our partners. I remember it was a Tuesday afternoon, nice uh, countryside, 50 kilometers of Manila, and we visited a partner we were supposed to audit. 
Actually, I learned so much from what they were doing. They were into the battery business, manufacturing UPS batteries for, for our IT business of, of, of the company. They were state of the art in terms of taking back used batteries, selecting the best lead, the best uh, uh, components. They had their own smelting capacities. They were able to self-sustain themselves and they are a leader in providing high quality UPS batteries in the region while at the same time be so superior to their competitors in terms of recycled content and low uh, resource intensity. I think that blown me completely away and I learned so much more in that half a day I spent in their premise than in any lecture I got in Cambridge or Brussels, you know. It was so much of an experience when those business are making a good profit, a good differentiation out of being extremely resource conscious and performing. So what did we do at Schneider? What we did is we, 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 we listened to our customers. So we, we surveyed customers, right, left, centers, in many countries. I won't go through the details. There are so many questions and answers with the customers we've been having. And some of you in the room, electricians, panel builders, end users, specifiers. You know, we've surveyed virtually all of our partnerships and customers, and they told us what is important for them in succeeding in their business. And to make it short, I would not go through those details. They told us two things. They want two things from us. They want peace of mind, they want performance. And they want peace of mind and performance around sectors, across sectors. Across sectors, they told us they want peace of mind and performance because first they said, make my business simple. I want you guys to help me navigate in the complex environmental regulations, REACH, ROHS, China, Prop 65. There are so many and counting in this part of the globe, in any other part of the globe. So being able to be making their life simple and transparent, fully digitized, any product of Schneider, you can QR code them here on stage. You get automatically the profiles on environmental profile, end of life, compliance. So that's something they asked. They asked us also, Peace of mind in, you know, we talk circularity in big, 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 you know, conferences as a vague concept. You know, for them it's very real. What it means, please manufacture products whose lifespan is, can be extended. Make Master Pack MTZ, the one you can see in EcoStructure Power Booth, one of our blockbusters. It can be retrofitted, it can be connected, of course, it can be leased as a service, it can be financed in many ways. So, they, they want simplicity and performance. For them, it's moving from capex to opex. For them, it's minimizing the cost of ownership. So this is what they told us. They told us, you know, peace of mind was also to come with super safe products. In the building environment, those of you who work in that space, you know the customers, customers, they want, you know, no issue. They want great homes for their customers, phthalate-free, halogen-free, they don't want any problem. And even they want to differentiate with better offers. They want really super, super healthy. That's what they told us. They told us two more things. Peace of mind is also performance. Hey, help me get products which save my P&L, which helps my bottom line. So they've told us obviously that loud and clear and that's a key value proposition of Schneider. And to conclude what they told us, they want peace of mind and performance and they want to perform in their markets. They want us to help them create the best buildings. They want them to be able for their own customers to create the best industries for their customers. You'll hear more from Siwon in the building sector, but that's what they told us. So that's why we are sharing that with you today. What we humbly try and do as a company to value sustainability within our value proposition in Schneider. But I've spoken enough. Let me now hand it over to our panelists. So what I will uh, now uh, ask is invite Mathis uh, Wackernagel, who, as I said, travels the world throughout the, the year and meets different stakeholders to share with us his perspective on how and whether it is a combination which works, you know, sustainability business, where does he see uh, the global economy going and whether he sees great examples around. Mathis. Thank, thank you, Xavier. Xavier. It's wonderful to be here. I'm here. We are here to get to know you. Now we hear you. Uh, it's very interesting. So I just wondered actually, how many from you come from outside of Singapore? I'm one of them, yeah. M most, wow, it's amazing. How many work more in the technical area? Engineering types, yeah. How many more in the marketing marketing side? Yeah, so it's the economic case. It's a great mixture. Um, th that's it's the most important thing to be able to combine the technology as well as the marketing. So. I'm Matthias Wackernagel. Thank you very much for inviting me. We're with Global 
footprint network. We are ecological accountants and say, oh my God, how boring, accounting. <laughs> but actually it's quite significant because accounting helps us to understand how much we earn compared to how much we spend. If we spend more than what we earn, we don't die immediately, but it's not so healthy. You know? So it's actually good to understand how much we earn and how much we um, spend. And we do that ecologically as well. So sometimes they call accountants bean counters. We actually are bean counters. We count the beans, we count the rice, we count the milk, we count the electricity from the perspective of how much earth is necessary to renew what we consume. Because the potato that I eat, you cannot eat. And the orange juice that I drink, you cannot drink. And the fish that you eat, I cannot eat. So we can add up all the areas necessary to support me. What's my personal farm on the planet? And we call that the ecological footprint. And then we can compare that with how much area is available. And we can do that for any country as well. For example, I'm from Switzerland originally. If you add up everything that the Swiss consume, we like chocolate, as you know, for example, and we, we like beautiful watches. So if you add that all up and compare that with the farm called Switzerland, the Swiss farm is four times smaller than what we consume in Switzerland, for example. So is that a problem or is it not a problem? I mean, Switzerland has high income, so we can buy it from other places. But uh, in the end, what's the situation for the world? Because the, the largest farm that we have is called Planet Earth. It doesn't work. Uh, yeah. It was. Uh, the largest farm we have is called Planet Earth. And if we compare the appetite of humanity compared to Planet Earth, we find out, oh my God, we're using 1.7 planets. How is that possible? It's like with money, you can spend more than what you earn, but not forever. And so we translate that in something that is more easily understandable. We translate that into time and say, actually, from January 1st to August 1st, humanity has used as much as Earth can renew in the entire year. Now, is that a good thing? Some people say, yeah, but on August 2nd, the day after I opened my fridge, there was still beer in the fridge, so it cannot be that bad. Um, and that's true, there is still beer in some of the fridges, uh, but essentially this just means after August 1st, we're starting to be in a depleting phase, and we can do that so much. And that's what also caught our attention when we started to see, oh, wow, Schneider is really interesting in that perspective because their entire business model is focused on how can we accelerate moving humanity out of ecological overshoot? How can we move that date out? We call it move the date. And that's the business proposition. And it dawned on us, companies like Schneider Electric and also the ones that they serve, Humanity is much better off having these companies to actually achieve the goal of where they need to go. And even if you were somebody like Warren Buffett, for example, I would, know, I would want to know which company has a business model aligned with moving humanity out of overshoot. Why? Because those who provide services that are needed more and more will find an opening market. Those who are married to a way of producing that just has less and less of a future, on average, just will not be able to do so well. And there are huge time constants built into companies, into cities, into countries. So thinking ahead, that's why we have a frontal cortex. We can think ahead. And that's why what, what brings the power to, to, to putting things into metrics and say, where are the opportunities? Sustainability in the end, that's the last point I would like to make. Essentially, we should forget about that word. We should just call it success. Success on a planet that is overused is no longer possible without sustainability. That's the most sound, long-term, effective business strategy there is. And that makes the work so exciting with people like here on the panel, uh, because that's where the future lies. Thank you, Matt. I like this, uh, forget about sustainability, call it success. I like this pitch of yours. I think it's a good uh, takeaway from me. And I think we need to hear from you for, further about what are the other models you see around the globe which you see are part of the solution. Uh, we'll, we need to ask uh, questions for, for you in, in the Q&A session. Uh, Kevin, maybe to you, uh, you host this event. Uh -huh. uh, congratulations, by the way. I saw in the news, uh, Do Jones recognized Marina Bay Sands as the world's best luxury resort hospitality company in the world in terms of their sustainability uh, realizations and achievements, while at the same time they do a fantastic business and a very profitable property. So Kevin, what is the recipe for, 
for this. <laughs> First of all, welcome to Marina Bay Sands. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we yes? can. Great. I love metrics as well, by the way, Mantis. And I'll throw out a lot of metrics in the next three to four minutes as I describe this. So I started the company 10 years ago. At the time we launched that sustainability program, it was not front and center. But in that past 10 years, uh, we've grown the program immensely. And the biggest driver of that isn't just cost savings or efficiencies, it's really driven by customer, de customer demand. For example, the event you're in right now is our largest green event that we've had of the year so far. Uh, we do 2,000 events a year in this convention center. So we have 250 meeting rooms, six exhibition halls, 2,000 events, about 10% of those are clients that come to us because they want to have a sustainable event. That includes the food, the settings, the materials, Every single piece of furniture here left over is going to the Association of People for Special Needs. So there's a real demand that we've seen grown exponentially in the last 10 years for sustainable events, sustainable food. Um, we also have a mall and hotel here. So we have 2,600 hotel rooms. We've averaged 98% occupancy since 2010 at an average daily rate that's gone up from 350 to 500 last year. Um, at the same time, we've, with, by improving technology, working with partners like Schneider, like DP here, like Cisco, uh, we've reduced our carbon footprint by 34% in five years. We have a target to get to 70% by 2030. Um, and this is all while we've grown our footfall in the property from 35 million in 2012 to 45 million last year. Uh, and the footfall is, just to give you a, a comparison from those from California, that's, that's about what Disney does in Anaheim. Um, so the point being that the sustainability angle, both for our guests, B2B, B2C, and as well from the operational efficiencies, the cost savings, the reliability, uh, makes a lot of sense for us. As a result, I've, I've been in this job for 10 years now as the head of sustainability. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Kevin. You know, I, again, 45 million, as I told you before. You know, it's almost as many visitors that France receives every other year. So <laughs> look, this property is so highly visited. Uh, great job, uh, thank you, Kevin. So Sue On, so you are very much in the green uh, building sector for, for a number of years now. You, you are from the Singapore market. Your company, DP uh, comp Architect, works in different sectors. Can you share with us the trend? Is it a real demand you see in the building sector for green premises? Is it big? Is it just a, a fad? Yeah, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Siu On. Actually, I'm a designer, I'm an engineer. I'm part of uh, DP Architect Groups. We are local grown firm here. So basically, sustainability is very much a DNA of uh, DP Sustainable Design. We are the specialist arm of DP Architects, meaning we are providing service in terms of uh, sustainability initiatives, uh, be it for Leeds or even uh, BREAM or even Singapore Green Mark Industry Standard. So we offer this consultancy service to help the client overseas and also locally how they can achieve the sustainability design to meet their requirement. Now the question is, uh, from our interaction with a lot of our clients overseas, there is a growing demand in terms of uh, adopting green building design. Why is it so? Because the client realised that the benefits, no doubt that they have to pay significantly a higher more 4-5% to of capital cost outlay, but in the long run, they enjoy a better rental or even the resale value of the properties. Now, besides that, I think there's also a demand from the tenants who are looking for green building design. So, not only that, the people are more concerned about the indoor air quality, environmental living standards, thermal comforts, but ultimately, what we can do is really to do something to assist the environmental sustainability. So, so I guess... Uh, can for you us take uh, examples maybe in, you know, of areas, buildings you've accompanied? Sure. So closer to home, I think in Singapore, we have completed quite a fair bit of uh, major uh, platinum projects. One of them is uh, re completed the fourth university of uh, Singapore. They call it Singapore University of Techno Technological Design. So how we approach sustainability from that angle is we really do a passive design coupled with the active design strategy. So passive design, we are using a standalone uh, simulation building analysis simulation tools to enhance the building analysis performance. So that at the very early stage of the conceptual design, we are able to provide to the architect, be it DPA or even external architect, a robust solutions. How can they actually choose a form that will best enhance the climatic response in relation to solar radiation or maybe the wind harnessing for natural ventilation, maximization, and ultimately 
to do a more energy intensive uh, active design so that we can reduce the carbon footprint and aim for the zero carbon. Of course, the most recent one, uh, I think we have also, uh, I think Snyder Hub in Kalang has already achieved the so-called the latest green mark criteria for existing building criteria uh, that are actually the platinum rated. So I think that is a very commendable effort for Snyder to continue this global commitment to do all the sustainable design. These are the probably two examples I would like to share. Yeah, thank you, uh, Siu On. And if you have questions on this uh, achievement, a bit of publicity for this Kalang Singapore buildings by Schneider, you have at the back of the room uh, Damien Delem, who can be uh, back to you at the end, you know, answer to your questions about how those technologies help make a green platinum uh, building for retrofitting, which is a big avenue for transformation we see. Thank you, Siu On. Uh, our last panelist, Martin. Martin is uh, from Cisco. Uh, Cisco, well-known technology company, as Kevin mentioned, very much present in this building. So tell us how you help your customers to, to be more sustainable and what you do for yourselves. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Xavier, for the introduction and good afternoon, good morning to everyone, audi audiences and participants to this great event. It's my pleasure to be here and certainly thank you, Standard Electric, to invite Cisco to be part of this event, great event. I've been meeting a lot of the partners and customers during the last couple of days to showcase some of our solutions we did uh, develop jointly together in the IT domain, in power domain industry and also certainly buildings domain that I was part of the um, booth keepers in the last 36 hours. So a lot of great dialogue, but certainly I'll introduce myself a little bit more. So I belong to the global partner organization driving strategic alliances primarily for Asia Pacific. Uh, certainly Schneider is one of my main industry vertical that I work closely with, but we do have other partners dealing with the manufacturing sectors in transportation, you know, just to name a few for, for your reference. Um, so in terms of sustainability, I can quote a number of cases and examples in terms of what our company do and in terms of the customer showcases. So in the uh, uh, next couple of years, uh, our company goal is to achieve uh, avoiding carbon green gas emission by one million ton. And in fact, uh, in the last year, our record shows we have uh, achieved about 710,000 uh, uh, tons of uh, greenhouse gas emission. And in fact, a lot of our corporate campuses are now LEED. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you guys know what, what that means. It's uh, energy and environmental uh, design to leadership on, on all the rest. And we do implement connected workplace solutions in a lot of our campuses. So in a, in a way that would reduce you know, our staff to travel and in, in the overall point of achieving the objective of sustainability. And in fact, um, in some of our India campuses, um, in fact, we are working together on this, uh, Xavier. So we are tapping into the solar power farm. Um, I think a lot of the campuses there is being tapped onto those uh, renewable energy resources. And my um, um, reference and recall indicates it's up to 50% of the campus building is tapping into that. And we also have um, you know, energy saving solutions looking into the unoccupied spaces of some of these uh, company buildings. So if there's no people or participants occupying the, the meeting rooms, we'll try to turn even the stand uh, by power even off. So that's to save a little bit more power in, in terms of achieving the uh, sustainability. So I'll leave it at that, Xavier, to kickstart yeah, the dialogue. Maybe another question for you, uh, Martin, uh, while I'm now starting to open to questions. Cisco, you, you guys are known to provide you know, telepresence uh, facilities. We, many of us use those technologies. It, it avoids travel. Is it something where your customers say, hey, guys, why don't you come along and save us money, save us carbon emissions? Is it a dialogue you have with your customers? Yeah, I'll quote from the internal perspective first. So in fact, in the last um, five, 10, 10 years, uh, we encouraged employee to save traveling by using our collaborating suites of solutions. So we have the state-of-the-art telepresence solutions. We also have WebEx, which, which is all web-based. So as long as you know, anyone can access the application, they can communicate to the rest of the, the colleagues within the internal company. We can share information, we can set presentation slides, and we can even chat to each other. It's all unified. So in terms of you know, helping employee to save traveling costs and the company expense and all the rest, these are great solutions. And we do have demonstration facility in our Singapore Customer Briefing Center and throughout the rest of Asia, in Japan, for instance. Any number you want to share? Any, are you able to share any numbers? With um, all right, um, this is a bit of um, a funny thing. So we are being quoted as um, the biggest competitor of Southwest Airlines. And in the last 10 years, <laughs> we have helped um, save the company 1.5 billion US dollar in terms of reducing the, uh, the traveling cost for our employee. 
So okay. just to quote an example. Impressive. <laughs> That's where technology can come into play. So uh, pre start preparing your questions, intervention. I will ask questions to the panelists to, to follow up the dialogue with them. Sorry, I need to give it back to, to Mattis. So I wanted to uh, ask Mattis, you, as you said, sustainability maybe should be called success. You were nice with uh, our CEOs and this company saying they are part of the solution, but are, are you finding reasons to be optimistic? Do you see many uh, initiatives around the globe where you travel, where you see those models emerging, where you know, people are coming with the solutions? Tell us your state of mind. Thank you, Xavier. I was trained as an engineer, and we didn't have classes about optimism, hope, despair. <laughs> we just learned how to calculate. And I think that's what the, re what, what, the, what the importance of metrics are as well. Metrics help us to see life more clearly. I find it very interesting, actually. My sister is a medical doctor, and she also, she, oops, she also works uh, with, uh, um, with, sorry, she, she also works with um, accrediting pilots medically. And so she sees the big difference in the airline industry and in the medical industry. In the airline industry, they know it takes about seven mistakes at the same time to make a flight unsafe. And so if one mistake happens, they embrace it, they learn it, they want to know what's going to happen so they can avoid it and they're not six mistakes from an from a, from a error, you know? In the medical profession, everybody tries to hide their mistakes and they don't learn from their mistakes. So metrics are our friends. If we use them, we can make very safe airplanes. So it's not about despair or hope. It's really how to use metrics to drive success. We just okay. talked about that earlier. What, how do metrics need to be designed to be effective? They need to be accurate, obviously, but that's not all. They have to be relevant to you. And even more importantly, they have to be empowering to your to, to your CEO in the end, and then things happen. And that's what we have seen around the world. Some countries embrace metrics and then drive innovation and foresight through that, and they can be successful, others don't see it. So I think the biggest gap is not about whether we have hope or despair, but really to recognize that by having strong te technology-driven like, information that we understand what's going on on the ground, we can build our long-term success. So, so I if I understand you, and maybe the takeaway from what you are saying here, you advise uh, or you, you share the fact that having a metric approach to say, hey, that business of mine is compatible with one planet. That business of mine is compatible with a two degrees climate. That's okay to, to pursue and grow. And your metrics would have a company say, hey, that model may not be so compliant with a yeah. planet, so maybe I should look into it. This is the kind of discussion you have with corporations. We often use this, this word one planet or this double word one planet and people think that's a constraint. We don't, it, we don't think it's a constraint, we don't think it's a metaphor or it's a goal, it's just our context. By understanding your context better, by understanding where you're at, you can operate much more successfully, you can bet more successfully and that's what it's all about because in the end it's very, very simple. Either we have one planet prosperity or we have one planet misery doesn't take that long to make a decision which one may be the better choice. Um, and, and so that's really what it boils Thank down to. Much. It's a context, how do we operate best given physical reality. Thank you, Mathis. So on that, on that side, the ones of you who will be able to do the tour of sustainability at 2.15, you see that we are trying to calculate how much of CO2 we help our customers avoid to see which of our businesses are the most sustainable and which are the ones where we need to improve our performance. Thank, thank you, Matty. Kevin, you shared a very beautiful picture. You know, you save money, your investors are happy, your guests are willing to get to your premise, which is always full. Any challenge in the, in the journey? Is it a walk in the park? You know, it seems so easy to bring the two things together, hearing to you. Well, yeah, there certainly are plenty of challenges. I think I'll, I'll, just, I'll describe the one that's most relevant to this group, um, because there's plenty of challenges. <laughs> Um, I, so look, when we went on our, our carbon reduction journey, there were probably, I would say there are three main stages of that life cycle, right? The first was we chopped off all the low hanging fruit, changed our things to LEDs, put some sensors in. And that was probably 2010 to 2012 ish. Um, and the second stage of that cycle then was uh, ensuring all of your equipment is working as it should. So commissioning, recommissioning, making sure you have 100% reliability with, with all of your equipment. And again, that, that, that wasn't rocket science. That took a little bit of effort, but it's it's really important. And you know, we probably saved 10 to 15 percent just on that. 
We're going through the third wave right now, and that is in new technology and data analytics. And you hear this in conferences all the time. I do the circuit as well, but we are really 100% uh, uh, seeing results from this concept. Um, we have uh, 90,000 sensors on this property. Uh, we've doubled that in the last five years from 45,000. We have a platform on-prem in-house that grabs all of that cranks out the data, runs algorithms on it every 10 minutes. Uh, and it tells us some incredible things about prolonged cooling, when a, when a valve is stuck. Really simple stuff that we had no access to before. And that was really the next one that took us another 10, 15% down. We're looking, we're still in that wave. Um, the challenge with that is finding what the right technology is, because it is, the new technology is very nascent, right? Yeah. It is very nascent, but I think that we are, we are very encouraged by the, the opportunity with that. Thank you very much for the sharing, and you shared also the, uh, the challenges of uh, retrofitting while having such a property which is running at full speed. You have to be very smart in executing those transformations while being uh, as full as you are. Thank you. Uh, Su uh, questions we may have is, you know, any, any customer typology, who are the ones really keen to get those green platinum? Is it in Singapore? Is it around the area? Is it some end users? Is it only the builders and the landlords? Or where, where do you see the expectations coming loud and clear? And where maybe you don't hear that that much? Can you share that with us? Yeah, certainly. I think uh, one thing is I tend to agree with what Kelvin had just said. Basically, I think designing for a green building, we have to look beyond just the conceptual stage. I mean, you can put in a lot of effort, a lot of green design. But ultimately, when the building is completed, hand over to the maintenance team, that is where is the life cycle cost of the building will come in. I think uh, it's important for us to be able to enable the facility management team to take on this green building design to even further or even keep it status quo to maintain the energy, water reduction or energy resource efficiency. How do we do that? Uh, basically, there's this uh, smart FM, facility management. Riding on all those open platforms like EcoStructure or maybe those uh, Honeywell Johnson Control system, they are available a lot of uh, internet of things, data analytics that we can actually connect together and how we can harness them so that we can maintain the energy efficiency of, for example, like the different building typologies, energy consumption efficiency, water consumption reduction savings, and even environmental man, uh, material selection. Yeah. Sometimes over the years, when the building going through a retrofit life cycle, the material selection becomes very important. Are we using recycling material yeah. as part of so-called the sustainable initiatives? So bringing from conceptual design into the life cycle building analysis, now that is where the client will demand. Yeah. So your question is like whether the building, the client, the designer, or even the build, uh, the owner coming in. Now all these are very important stakeholders that we got to got the buy in from the conceptual stage. So right from the beginning, we have to design with the maintenance in mind. That means the maintenance team from the client has to be brought in so that they understand the design of the green building, how it can be ultimately be operated towards the end. That will be where we can maximize the benefits of the green building design. And if I hear you well, so both everybody on the chain can win something. The owner can say, hey, my, my asset has more value because it's a green mark building. It can have a longer lifespan. The user can say, hey, it saves my energy bills, correct? And the uh, visitors, the, the, the people working from that premise enjoy a better place. So you are building a case where each of the stakeholders on the chain gain something out of it, correct? Precisely. The owner will enjoy the, of course, the quick rental return, higher rental return, maybe resale value. The tenants will come in, enjoy a better indoor air quality environment, which is benefiting is the health of the employee or maybe the tenant and user. Uh, the productivity of the maintenance team can be improved. Instead of having a more rigorous and more laborious manpower, they can cut down maybe to a few manpower because they can do a lot of remote monitoring and control. And also, equipment-wise, over the years, that can be predicted through diagnostic software application, whether it's going to fail or maybe they need maintenance. So all this will upkeep the system to be in the top gear for operation. And ultimately, all these savings is coming back to the client. Yeah. That's where the client will come in very interested to say, I want to go for green building design. But that's where the whole chains of whether we are designer, the advocator, the end solution provider will need to come in together to buy in that this is the green building and ultimately it's really sustainable. And that's why we firmly believe in DP sustainable design. And we really hope that this is just a green journey that every firm will also will, can follow suit because ultimately it will help in our bottom line. It really is a profit not only to the developer but it's also to the designer as well. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. My last question will be to Martin. Prepare your questions. We're going to be having 10 more minutes to, for the Q&A. So uh, again, while 
preparing, discussing what amongst panelists, we realized we all of us were engaged into this building. You have Kevin, the end user, DP uh, architects engaged in designing green parts of the building, Cisco providing the IT part of it, Real, we realized we were together on many, and, and Schneider actually providing uh, OT and energy distribution. So question to you, Martin, is you work in ecosystems, you have responsibility of partners. Is it the way to go to deliver sustainable value proposition? You have to go together with you know, a number of partners. Is it the strategy which you are following? It's a great pitch and very <laughs> wonderful dialogue. You know, our panelists and certainly summarized by you, Xavier. So this is exactly what Cisco is driving um, in terms of the partner ecosystem to deliver sustainable solutions in different verticals. So just now, all our panelists, Xavier, you mentioned about the uh, smart connected buildings, value chain players. So the, the architect, our customer, OT, IT, all driving towards a converged solution. This is a great you know, showcase of if there is any request um, on the audience from the floor in terms of potential projects you want to build uh, new green buildings, um, we, we are the main players within the value chain to, to engage with. So, you know, you're just looking at the, the right people to drive to the next step of the evolution in terms of business disruption and digital transformation for the, for the new era. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So, now the time is yours uh, to ask your questions. Share any experience you may have in your own companies. Questions to the panelists. They're all for you. There's a mic which is coming to you. To the panelists. Hello. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Kevin Tang. Uh, I'm interested to know, uh, are you using a third-party software for your building analytics, uh, uh, an AFDD, or is it a program by your own, by your own IT company? Uh, so we're using a third party. Yeah, we've actually been to three vendors now. This is the third one we really like. Um, <laughs> so we've, we're using a third party. It's on-prem though, not in the cloud. Uh, we have a contract where they train our facilities engineers, so we have about five or six people on our building management system team that are really good at it. Uh, I would say though that for some of the more complex algorithms, we still have to lean on the third party. So it's not a cloud-based? Uh... No, we, uh, we, had, we did a cloud-based in 2014 and failed spectacularly. Um, so we, we're on-prem 100% right now. So that means the software is embedded in your system? Uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's embedded. We have a dedicated server for it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Engineering yeah. questions here, sorry for the non <laughs> No, your question were right to the point. Thank you very much sir, for, for asking. Another question here. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is uh, Roslyn from Myanmar. Uh, I want to ask a question to Kelvin and also Sion uh, regarding about uh, sustainability uh, green energy building. Because uh, for the green energy building, we need to spend more as an owner. We need to spend more. Uh, and I understand from Kelvin is that uh, there is a changes in uh, uh, solution in every two to three years time. So in fact, once we implement one solution, there will be one ROI, return on investment. So how do you manage in uh, changing the solution and the return on investment? Thank you. Yeah, so every single one of our projects, we calculate a, a discounted cash flow and the, end, the net present value and ROI on. Um, and there's definitely certain projects that have a higher ROI and some of those have a lower. The ones that I talked to you about, LED lighting, uh, retro commissioning, remote commissioning, uh, reli equipment reliability, then data analytics, almost all, all of those have under a 2.5 year payback. Uh, I'm happy to share with you the ones that don't um, at another time. <laughs> uh, I, it's fine. So we've installed solar PV on our roofs here, um, and they do not pay back within 2.5 years. That's one example. Roslina, thank you for asking that question. So uh, we have an office in uh, Myanmar, and also I think Myanmar is slowly recognizing uh, Singapore green mark as the industry standard. So uh, that's the good thing, you know. So I think uh, the, in developing countries, there's still this uh, hesitation from the owner to really embrace the green building design. Mainly, it's really the cost. Now, I think we have to look beyond just the cost because uh, sometimes uh, certain countries may look at maybe the environment and also the livelihood is maybe another factor to consider. But again, it's looking at the bigger picture. Sustainability, it can be embedded into the process with uh, ROI that can be accepted to the client to invest. Ultimately, during the life cycle of the building, you can reap the benefits 
maybe with a good payback period. And ultimately, it will enhance the so-called the so-called the financial part of the developer who invests into it, which they have to pay upfront quite a high bit of cost. Now, the second thing is we have to convince the user, meaning end of the day is a behavioral change. Are they able to embrace this uh, sustainable design so that they can live in a better environment, do their part to reduce the environment in terms of sustainability so that we can reduce so-called the temperature, the two degree rise. So ultimately, it's really a change of mindset. We are trying very hard also to convince some of our clients in Myanmar to please uh, allow us to you know, design something, maybe marrying the passive and the design. Because the passive is the easiest part to do. That's where you reduce the energy. Now, the active part is something that depends whether it's a solar system or type of air conditioning system. We can choose a hybrid that will suit the client's so-called budget requirement. Yeah. I like this dialogue because you, you point to the fact that, and I pass the bank over to Mattis, that all those transformations are not necessarily successful. Uh, business lens needs to be placed on those projects as any other. And I like the point you are making on behaviors changes which are accompanying the technology. We've talked a lot about technology and solutions so far. I like the dialogue about behaviors and, and the way we look at those transformations in different lands. Mathis, you wanted to add something. Any other person preparing the next question? Just okay. to add to Rosalia's question, um, obviously thinking about net present value as you do is essential, but there are two financial aspects that get underrepresented as well that are quite significant in sustainability investments. One is cost control, because if you, for, for example, if you buy a renewal contract, you know exactly what the value is of the contract in the long run, and so you can have stable cost into the future, which doesn't show up as clearly. The volatility is hard to kind of measure as a net present value function. The other piece is hedging your risks. Essentially, by investing in infrastructure that has more long-term value, that gains in a resource-constrained world, you're hedging against difficult times. Because it's not only about losing value, it's also not losing value at a time when the economy is difficult. So, so, you, so, so the hedging function of having the right infrastructure is also underappreciated often and is an enormous benefit to long-term investments. Thank you. Thank you. You had a question, I think, just behind you. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, discussion today. I work uh, for MSS. We're a component supplier to Schneider. And our CEO has just granted the approval for solar panels in the expansion from 4,000 square feet to uh, 4,000 square meters to 16,000 square meters. You mentioned the technology being very nascent. Um, I've, I'm flying out to India tomorrow, and I'd just like to pick your brains on the technology and the monitoring of the data that you was mentioning before, Kevin. Yeah, uh, this was a very long conversation, to be honest, about the technology, and we've explored many different panels. We actually installed BIPV here about five years ago as well the building integrated PV. I would say though that it's only, it's not, the solar PVs themselves aren't nascent. It's, you know, they've been around 20 years and they've been developed. It just, the, the finances don't work here in Singapore because it rains too much, right? And it's cloudy. Um, when I said the nascent technology, I was really talking about the data analytics side. And it's, it's a very crowded marketplace. There aren't really clear, uh, clear leaders in the business. Schneider has bought a few companies recently that have developed it, sure. but I still think that the data analytics side, we're seeing a lot of different products uh, that say that you know, say they can do something when they can't. And maybe to build on your point, and we can take it off after the session. We, I'm driving for the company that renewable electricity adoption across our 1,200 sites, and by country, by region in each country, we have a different approach to renewables. And I can share with you what solar is, is a great solution for us in our factories and sites in India. I can share with you the economics, how it works. And in, in India, it's one of the best countries we, we have in our list of countries where we operate, 100, where the payback is as fast starting year one uh, in terms of the PNL adoption, so the PNL impact. So that's a very good place to invest usually in our examples. Any other questions from, please, you want to add something? Any other questions from the room? We still have two minutes to go. <laughs> Martin. Just want to add something on the uh, solar PV solution uh, in terms of some of the business value, the value add. So in our Indie campus, the solution we jointly work together. So we help save more than 200 uh, gigawatt hour in the last year. And that is, in fact, enough to power more than 1.5 million homes for 12 month period, just to give some business implications from a commercial side energy efficiency as well.